Hello, lovelies. You're listening to episode 35 of the Broken Enchantments podcast, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. That's me. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Be sure to check out my Patreon for next week's episode, now available. You can check out the links below. Happy listening! As soon as the spy, or whatever he was, disappeared back into the kitchens, Janir gave the excuse of no appetite and headed for the apothecary. Leaving in the middle of the meal might not have been the most discreet thing to do, but she didn't think she would have been able to maintain composure through the remainder of dinner. The apothecary was built on the ground level of the castle and stood apart in its own building from the keep. A maze of tended herb beds and trellises spread out behind the small stone cottage in a leafy, haphazard maze. The entrance to the apothecary was a worn door with cast-iron handles rubbed smooth by a hundred ailing locals and almost as many apprentices. Janir shoved the door open and slipped in, tugging it shut after her. The apothecary was a single cramped room with a claustrophobically low roof. Bushels and bushels of recently harvested herbs hung from the ceiling in racks, or lay in heaps waiting to be hung. Near the door, a cupboard that was normally bursting with finished powders, tonics, and assorted herbal mixes was nearly emptied. Along the back wall, a table strewn with pestles, mortars, shearing knives, spools of twine, and other implements of the trade took up an entire side. The scent of dozens of herbs hung in the air like a fog. Some of the smells were sweet, others spicy, others bitter, but they all mixed into one indistinguishable hazy odor. Every time she came, she near felt she was trapped inside a spice box, packed in with drying plants and unable to break free. She shoved her way through the racks of herbs, the stiff stalks brushing against her face and catching at her hair. Seated at the table in the back, bent over something Janir couldn't see, Seavin crouched on a stool, the lamps in front of him starkly silhouetting his form. Numerous finished packages, Janir thought they looked like compresses, filled a basket to his left, most likely waiting to be soaked in boiling water and applied to wounds. With the castle's one healer and his three apprentices exhausted from the day's work, Seavin had volunteered to take over restocking the apothecary. Yes, Janir. It seemed no one ever surprised him. She made her way to stand beside him and remained still, trying to compose herself if only a little before telling him. He smiled and plucked something from her hair. It was the unrecognizable, shriveled leaf of some herb. Seven crushed it lightly and added it into the compress, folding the cloth pouch shut before adding it to the basket of others. The elf glanced back to her and paused. Is something amiss, Cardissima? Janir had been determined to be calm and collected when she spoke, but the words tumbled out of her mouth in a confusing jumble of fear. I don't know what to do. The servant who isn't a servant saw the carcotton. I have no idea if he knows what it was, but he'll probably ask if he doesn't. My father is too weak to be bothered with this, and— Hush. Seavin cut her off, the flickering lantern casting shadows over his angular face. Now, start at the beginning. I had taken one of my carcotton out at dinner. What? The elf shot her a sharp look. I didn't draw it. Well, I sort of did. But I had it hidden. At least— I thought I did. But when I looked up at the servant, I could tell that he had seen it, and I've seen him as a guard before, earlier today. Janir finished breathlessly. Why did you have your carcotton out at all? Seven demanded. I know I shouldn't have, Janir lamented. But when I touch them, they give me a sense of rightness. It's faint, but sometimes it's better than nothing. Seven sighed and shook his head. He muttered in elvish. There's something else, Janir sheepishly added. When I met Lucan again, after seven years since the last time we saw each other, I recognized him. And when I look at this man, I... There's something Argotolum about him. You mean that he is an Argotolum? Seavin shifted, shooting a glance to the door. No, but there's something Argotolum 
clinging to him. I don't know. It sounds strange. Janir shook her head. Strange does not mean untrue, Seven said. Should we go back to try and catch him? Janir fidgeted, kneading her hands behind her back. No, he is long gone by now, the elf surmised. So, what do we do? Wait, he is bound to turn up again, of that I am certain. We will tell Armandius of this as soon as he is strong enough. Seven touched her shoulder. I doubt the spy means you any harm. More likely, he was sent to confirm or disprove the rumors of an Argotolum being raised by Lord Kearson. Janir swallowed. We would never let anything happen to you, Seven assured her. Besides, I imagine that whoever sent him will be wanting substantial proof, not a glimpsed portion of a black rod for confirmation. What if, what if the Lord Argotolum wants me back? What if he decides that I should die? What if Luke and... Janir faltered. Sobs racked her body and she trembled. She had fear, so much fear of the unknown of the possibilities. Fear was a corrosive thing that spread like a disease, making her weak. Seovan wrapped his arms around her. Janir sobbed into his shoulder, feeling helpless. What could she possibly do if the Argotolums found out she was here? She knew the spy needed to be stopped from returning to report, but he had to be found first. But after they found him, what would they do to him? Armandius and Seovan wouldn't torture him, would they? Even in all that, there was something comforting about Seovan holding her. Janir drew a deep breath and closed her eyes, resting her forehead against his chest. Seovan touched the ends of her hair. De Valdeamo. Oximparamable. Janir may not have been fluent, but her elvish was good enough to understand. What was she supposed to do? She scrambled her brain for what to say in reply, but Seovan kept stroking her hair and holding her, as if it was nothing. He didn't realize she had understood. Janir cleared her throat. I'm all right now. She sniffled, brushing away her tears. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. She withdrew back a step. Think nothing of it, Seven calmly responded. Janir gulped. She knew that he meant the embrace, but it was rather difficult not to think anything of what he had said. What should we do now? I will see if I can hunt down this man. In the meantime, you should stay somewhere hidden. Somewhere you would not usually be. There are dozens of rooms and galleries in this castle where I could stay. Janir added, thinking of the many places she had explored during her childhood. Yes, and you still have the stone I gave you. It was not a question. I will go to Derek and tell him that there is a spy. No, do not fear. I will not tell him that this spy has anything to do with the Argotolums. I think it best that we wait, and let Armandius deal with that come. The elf led her back in the direction she had come. Why are we going back to the dining hall? Janir wondered. Not the dining hall, the kitchens. Janir blinked in confusion. I would not have you by yourself, and there is only one person here that either of us trusts enough. Janir still didn't understand, but followed without asking. She thought of suggesting she stay with Dame Salila, but the matron was with the wounded and Janir didn't want to disturb her. They reached the kitchens within a few moments. Everyone, from the head cook to the scullery maids, was striving with all their might to keep the queen happy and the wounded fed at the same time. A few mildly surprised glances were cast in the direction of the elfin girl as Seovan led the way to the back of the kitchens, where the actual preparation was done. There, skinny legs swinging off the edge of a table, Karel was busy flattering a kitchen maid close to his age. A strand of hair hung over her face as she stirred the contents of a large bowl, sticking to the side of her sweaty temple. Ah, the grace with which you stir the pudding is unparalleled, maiden fair. Oh, stop it! The maid snapped, but her cheeks colored. It must be quite something for a lowly kitchen maid to be paid the attentions of Carlyle, the son of a knight. A pudding stirred by one of your beauty would taste... Carlyle, Seovan shamelessly interrupted. The enchanter glared at Seovan. 
Goblin, she was about to let me lick the spoon. The kitchen maid simply turned away. Carl went on. You smell like you've been rolling in the spice cupboard. Why don't you go in... Jneer? Come, Savin beckoned. Carl didn't move. Please. The elf sighed. Carl ever so casually slipped off the table, taking his sweet time about it. Carl, Jneer pleaded. The enchanter sped up and followed them at a brisk pace out of the kitchens. Seavan led the pair down the halls until they were well away from any whom I overhear. The corridor stretched into murky darkness with moonlight spilling through the windows along one side. There were a few tapestries between the doors, placed every seven sword lengths or so. Otherwise, the hall was empty. Enchanter, Seavan began. We believe that there is a spy in the castle. A spy? Goody! Are we going to hunt him down? Carl rubbed his hands, far too happy at the news. No, I am going to hunt him down. You are going to stay here and protect Janir. Janir felt a little insulted at that. Despite being the girl, since she had met Carl, she had been mostly the one protecting him. We believe that this spy may be after her. Janir will fill you in on the details, but for now I need you to stay here and look after her. I am going to inform the captain of the guard. Do you understand? Seven stared at Carl with a hard, serious gaze. How in the name of all that is sweet and creamy am I supposed to protect Janir? Janir had been thinking much the same thing. Seven stared down the enchanter unperturbed. You can scream, can you not? A newborn baby can scream. Stay near her. I will find the two of you before morning. Hopefully when we have captured the spy. Stay out of sight. He disappeared into the dimly lit corridor like a ghost. Well, Carl huffed, grumbling under his breath. Snooty elf. Janir crouched under one of the paned windows. Janir crouched under one of the paned windows and wrapped her arms around her knees. Carl plopped down beside her. Not that I have anything against elves in general. Except when they run, they bound along like gazelles. It's disgusting. Of course, I'm not saying that... Carl paused. You haven't even looked at me. Are you mad at me? Do you like the way elves run? What? No. No, Carl. I'm sorry. I'm just... distracted. By what? The fear that some extremely unpleasant and perpetually ill-tempered despot is out to get you? Janir lolled her head in the enchanter's direction and glared. No, but thank you for reminding me. Hmm, what then? That is none of your business, Janir said flatly, a little surprised to find she wasn't angry. Why not? If there was one thing Kariel hated, it was being deprived information. But what Seovan had said he had not intended for even her to understand, of that she was certain. Why he hadn't spoken in her native tongue, Janir wasn't sure. Maybe he just felt that the time wasn't right. Maybe he believed that nothing would ever come of it. But she didn't doubt that he had meant what he had said. Hello, are you still there? Carl yelled, waving a hand in front of her face. Janir jerked away. Stop it. Well, you seemed to vacate your physical form there for a second or two. What is it that you're thinking about but can't tell me? Janir grumbled and ignored him. Hey, where are you going? Without answering, Janir slipped inside one of the rooms along the corridor. Just as she had expected, Carl followed after her. Behind the door was a sparsely furnished apartment that hadn't been used in years, but had been kept in good order nonetheless. A chill hung in the air. Janir rubbed her arms and shivered. A door in the back led into a bedchamber and two cushioned armchairs were drawn up beside a large hearth. An oil painting of a famous Kaerson long since gone hung over the mantel. There wasn't a fire in the hearth but the wood had been stacked in preparation for one. Janir motioned to the pyramid of logs. Light it, would you? Carl stared at the logs for a long moment before he murmured incoherent words and a spark caught the kindling wood. A small, steady flicker gradually grew. Thank you. Janir made her way to the armchair on the far side and eased into the cushioned seat. Carl flopped into the chair beside her and leaned against the side, all but melting into his seat. 
Chinir wondered if using magic was really that exhausting. The fire gradually grew, and tongues of flame began licking at the logs. In a few moments, the fire was radiating heat. Chinir curled up into a tighter ball and tucked her legs under her. You're going to tell me whatever it is that you won't, Karel muttered. Chinir opened her mouth to argue, but the enchanter was already nodding off. If Karel wanted to fall asleep and leave her alone, she had no intentions of interfering. You have been listening to Broken Enchantments, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. Don't forget to check out my Patreon for early access to episodes, bonus content, and lots of patrons-only freebies. You can learn more at elizabethwheatley.com. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. I'll see you next time.